I learned about witches. In fairy tales, witches always wear silly black hats and black coats, and they ride on broomsticks. But this is not a fairy tale. This is about real witches. The most important thing you should know about real witches is this. Listen very carefully. Never forget what is coming next. Real witches dress in ordinary clothes and look very much like ordinary women. They live in ordinary houses and they work in ordinary jobs. This, that is why they are so hard to catch. A real witch hates children with a red hot sizzling hatred that is more sizzling and red hot than any hatred you could possibly imagine. A real witch spends all her time plotting to get rid of the children in her particular territory. Her passion is to do away with them one by one. It is all she thinks about the whole day long. Even if she is working as a cashier in a supermarket or typing letters for a businessman or driving around in a fancy car, and she could be doing any of these things. Her mind will always be plotting and scheming and churning and burning and whizzing and pissing with murderous, bloodthirsty thoughts. Which child, she says to herself all day long, exactly which child should I choose next for my next squelching? The, a real witch gets the same pleasure from squelching a child as you get from eating a plate full of strawberries and thick cream. She reckons on doing away with one child a week. Anything less than that, she becomes grumpy. One child a week is 52 a year. Squish them, squiggle them, make them disappear. That is the motto of all witches. Very carefully, a victim is chosen. Then the witch stalks the wretched child like a hunter stalking a little bird in the forest. She treads softly. She moves quietly. She gets closer and closer. Then at last, when everything is ready, and she swoops. Sparks fly, flames leap, oil boils, rats howl, skin shrivels, and the child disappears. A witch, you must understand, does not knock children on the head or stick knives into them or shoot them with a pistol. People who do those things get caught by the police. A witch never gets caught. Don't forget that she has magic in her fingers and devilry dancing her blood. She can make stones jump about like frogs, and she can make tongues of flame go flickering across the surface of water. These magic powers are very frightening. Luckily, there are not a great number of real witches in the world today, but they are still enough to make you nervous. In England, there are probably about a hundred of them together. Some countries have more, others not quite so many. No country in the world is completely free of, from witches. A witch is always a woman. I do not wish to speak badly about women. Most women are lovely, but the fact remains that all witches are women. There is no such thing as a male witch. On the other hand, a ghoul is always a male. So is a barhest. Both are dangerous, but neither of them is half as dangerous as a real witch. As far as children are concerned, a real witch is easily the most dangerous of all the living creatures on Earth. What makes her doubly dangerous is the fact that she doesn't look dangerous. Even when you know all the secrets, you will hear about those in a minute, you can still never be quite sure whether it is a witch you are gazing at or just a kind lady. If a tiger was able to make yourself look like a large dog with a waggy tail, you would probably go up and pet him on the head, and that would be the end of you. It is the same with the witches. They all look like nice ladies. Kindly examine the pictures below. Which lady is a witch? That is a difficult question, but it is one that every child must try to answer. For all you know, a witch might be living next door to you right now, or she might be the woman with the bright eyes who sat up opposite you on the bus this morning. She might be the lady with the dazzling smile who offered you a sweet from a white paper bag in the street before lunch. She might even, and this will make you jump, she might even be your school teacher who is reading these words 
to you at this very moment. Look carefully at that teacher. Perhaps she is smiling to the absurdity of such a suggestion. Don't let that put you off. It could be part of her cleverness. I'm not, of course, telling you for one second that your teacher might actually be a witch. All I'm saying is that she might be one. It is most unlikely, but, here comes the big but, it is not impossible. Oh, if only there was a way of telling for sure whether a woman was a witch or not, then we could round them all up and put them in the meat grinder. Unhappily, there is no such way. But there are a number of little signals you can look out for. The quirky habits that all witches have in common. And if you know about these, if you remember them always, then you might just possibly manage to escape from being squelched before you are very much older. My grandmother. I myself had two separate encounters with witches before I was eight years old. From the first, I escaped unharmed, but on the second occasion, I was not so lucky. Things happen to me that probably make you scream when you read about them. That can't be helped. The truth must be told. The fact that I am still here and able to speak to you, how peculiar I might look, is due entirely to my wonderful grandmother. My grandmother was a Norwegian. The Norwegians know all about witches. For Norway, with its black forces and icy mountains, is where the first witches came from. My father and my mother were also Norwegian, but because my father had a business in England, I was born there and had lived there and had started going to an English school. Twice a year, at Christmas and in the summer, I went back to Norway to visit my grandmother. This old lady, as far as I could gather, was just about the only surviving relative we had on either side of our family. She was my mother's mother, and I absolutely adored her. When she and I were together, we spoke in either Norwegian or English. It didn't matter which. We were equally fluent in both languages, and I have to admit that I felt closer to her than my to my mother. Soon after my son's birthday, my parents took me as usual to spend Christmas with my grandmother in Norway, and it was over there while my father, mother, and I were driving in icy weather just north of Oslo, that our car skidded off the road and went tumbling down into a rocky ravine. My parents were killed. I was firmly strapped into the back seat and only received the cut on the forehead. I won't go into the horrors of the terrible afternoon. I still get sh the shivers when I think about it. I was finished up, of course, back in my grandmother's house with their arms wrapped around me tight, and both of us crying the whole night long. What are we going to do now? I asked her through the tears. You'll stay here with me, she said, and I'll look after you. Aren't I going back to England? No, she said. I could never do that. Heaven shall take my soul, but Norway shall keep my bones. The next day, in order that we might both try to forget our great sadness, my grandmother started telling me stories. She was a wonderful storyteller, and I was enthralled by everything she told me. But I didn't become really excited when she got on to the subject of witches. She was apparently a great expert on these creatures, and she made it very clear to me that her witch stories, unlike most of the others, were not imaginary tales. They were all true. They were a gospel truth. They were history. Everything she was telling me about witches had actually happened, and now I had better believe it. What was worse, what was far, far worse, was that witches were still with us. They were all around us, and I had better believe that too. Are you really being truthful, Grandmama? Really and truly truthful? Oh, darling, she said. You won't last long in this world if you don't know how to spot a witch when you see one. But you told me that witches look like ordinary women, Grandmama. So how can I spot them? You must listen to me, my grandmother said. You must remember everything I tell you. After that, all you can do is cross your heart and pray to heaven, hope for the best. You were in the big living room of her house in Oslo, and I was ready for bed. The curtains were never drawn in that house. 
and through the windows I could see huge snowflakes falling slowly onto an outside world that was as black as tar. My grandmother was tremendously old and wrinkled, with a massive white body which was smothered in gray lace. She sat there majestic in her armchair, feeling every inch of it. Not even a mouse could have squeezed in to sit beside her. And myself, just seven years old, was crushed on the floor at her feet, wearing pajamas, dressing gown, and slippers. You swear you aren't pulling my leg? I kept saying to her, you swear you aren't just pretending? Listen, she said, I have known no less than five children who have simply vanished off the face of this earth, never to be seen again. The witches took them. I still think you're just trying to frighten me, I said. I am trying to make sure you don't go the same way, she said. I love you and I want you to stay with me. Tell me all the children who disappeared, I said. My grandmother was the only grandmother I ever met who smoked cigars. She lit one now, a long black cigar that smells of burning rubber. The first child I knew who disappeared, she said, was called Reinhild Hansen. Reinhild was about eight at the time, and she was playing with her little sister on the lawn. Her mother, who was baking bread in the kitchen, came outside for a air, breath of air. Where's Hanghild? she asked. She went away with a tall lady, the little sister said. What tall lady? the rest said. The tall lady in white gloves, the little sister said. She took Hanghild by the hand and led her away. No one, my grandmother said, ever saw Hanghild again. Didn't they search for her? I asked. They searched for miles around. Edward in the town helped, but they never found her. What happened to the other four children? I asked. They vanished just as Reinhild did. How, Grandmama? How did they vanish? In every case, a strange lady was sitting outside the house, just before it happened. But how did they vanish? I asked. The second one was very peculiar, my grandmother said. There was a family called Christensen. He lived up in Holmenkollen and they had an old oil painting in the living room, which they were very proud of. The painting showed some ducks in the yard outside a farmhouse. There were no people in the painting, just a flock of ducks on the grassy farmland and the farmhouse in the background. It was a large painting, rather pretty. Well, one day their daughter, Zudweg, came home from school eating an apple. She said a nice lady had given it to her on the street. The next morning, little Solveig was not in her bed. The parents searched everywhere, but they couldn't find her. Now, all of a sudden, her father shouted, There she is! That's Solveig feeding the ducks. He was pointing at the oil painting, and sure enough, Solveig was in it. She was standing in the farmyard in the act of throwing bread to the ducks out of the basket. The father rushed up to the painting and touched her, but that didn't help. She was simply a part of the painting, just a picture painted on the canvas. Did you ever see that painting, Grandmama, the little girl in it? Many times, my grandmother said. And the peculiar thing was that the little Sullivan kept changing her position in the picture. One day she would actually be inside the farmhouse and you could see her head looking out of the window. Another day she would be far over to the left with a duck in her arms. Did you see her moving in the picture of Grandmama? No one did. Wherever she was, whether she was outside feeding the ducks or inside looking out of the window, she was always motionless, just a figure of painting oils. It was all very odd, Grandma said. Very odd indeed. And what was most odd of all was that as years went by, she kept growing older in the picture. 10 years, the small girl had become a young woman. In 30 years, she was middle aged. And all at once, 54 years after it all happened, she disappeared from the picture altogether. Mean she died? I said. Who knows? My grandmother said. Some very mysterious things go on in the world of witches. That's two you've told me about, I said. 
On to the third one. The third one was the dog. Bridget Stevenson said, Grandma, my grandma said, she lived just across the road from us. One day, she started growing feathers all over her body. Within a month, she had turned into a very large white chicken. Her parents kept her for years in a pen in the garden. She even laid eggs. What color eggs, I said. Brown ones, my grandmother said. Biggest eggs I've ever seen in my life. Her mother made omelets out of them. Delicious they were. I gazed up at my grandmother, who sat there like some ancient queen on her throne. Her eyes were misty gray, and they seemed to be looking at something very, many miles away. The cigarette was the only real thing about her at that moment, and the smoke it made bellowed round her head in blue clouds. But the little girl who became a chicken did disappear, I said. No, not Bridget. She lived on for many years, laying her brown eggs. You said all of them disappeared. I made a mistake, Grandma said. I'm getting old. I can't remember everything. What happened to the fourth child, I asked. The fourth was a boy called Harold. My grandma said, one morning his skin went all yellow, grayish yellow, then it became hard and crackly, like the shell of a nut. By evening, boy had turned to stone. Stone? You mean, I said, you mean real stone? Grain in it, she said. I'll take you to see him if you like. You see, I keep him in the house. He stands in the hall, a little stone statue. Visitors lean their umbrellas up against him. Although I was very young, I was not prepared to believe everything my grandmother told me, and yet she spoke with such conviction, with such utter seriousness, and with never a smile on her face or a twinkle in her eye, that I found myself began to wonder. Go on, Grandmama, I said. Can we never find all together? What happened to the last one? Would you like a puff on my cigar? She said. I'm only seven, Grandmama. I don't care what age you are, she said. You never catch a cold if you smoke cigars. About number five, Grandmama. Number five, she said, chewing the end of her cigar as though it was a delicious asparagus. It was rather an interesting case. A nine-year-old boy called Lef was summer holidaying with his family on the forge, and the whole family was picnic picnicking and swimming off some rocks on one of those little islands. Young Lef dived into the water with his father, who was watching him, noticed that he stayed under for an unusually long time. When he came to the surface at last, he wasn't left anymore. Oh, was he, Grandma? He was a porpoise. He wasn't. He couldn't have been. He was a lovely young porpoise, she said, and as friendly as could be. Grandma said, yes, my darling. Did he really and truly turn to a porpoise? Absolutely, she said. I knew his mother well. She told me all about it. She told me how left the purples stayed with them all afternoon, giving his brothers and sisters rides on his back. They had a wonderful time. Then he waved a flipper at them and swam away, never to be seen again. Well, Grandmama, I said, how did they know that that purples was actually left? He talked to them, my grandmother said. He laughed and joked with them all the time he was giving them rides. But that... Wasn't there a tremendous fuss about what happened? I asked. Not much, my grandma said. You must remember that here in Norway, we are used to that sort of thing. There are witches everywhere. There's probably one living in our street this very moment. It's time you went to bed. A witch won't come into my window in the night, would she? I asked, quaking a little. No, my grandma said. A witch will never do silly things like climbing up drain pipes or breaking into people's houses. You'll be quite safe in your bed. Come along, I'll tuck you in.